Okay, it's been brought to my attention that there's some stuff being censored in these videos that I didn't censor before I put them out. I'm trying to tell a story here, you know? I don't want to leave anything out. So, just as a test, <clears throat> Snake and are members of an NGO dedicated and fighting. Also, Big Boss Kojima, David Hayter, and Metal Gear Rising is canon. Alright, let's see how that goes. If you talk to this kid, he actually gives you some useful information about where you need to head to next, telling you that there's stinger missiles in the west side of the hangar building. Hey, thanks, kid. And if you talk to this little girl, she makes you feel extremely guilty about the role you've played, not just in the tragedy of her life, but in the many wars you've fought, and the incalculable impact it's had on many people just like her. But otherwise, she hasn't got anything else to say. You fucking suck, kid. Your friend here is way cooler. He tells me about missiles and stuff. And if you head to where that kid says, there are indeed missiles there, which is cool for me because now I can take on the helicopter. And cool for the kid, I guess, because, I mean, if you're gonna grow up in this kind of dangerous environment, you need those sort of observational skills. That's not all we're here for, though. Before you leave, you want to go back over to the main hangar area. And through this door to the north. Yeah, it's another keycard. But this is a special keycard, see? It replaces the first three, so you don't need to card dance as much. There's three of these in the game, and before you can get each one, you need to have the three cards it replaces, which means at any one point in the game, you're still juggling through at least five of them, which isn't great, but it's progress. Anyway, head back up through the jungle, into the mine desert, past the noisy theme park sand, into this truck to pick up a ration, then once you're in the boss arena, call Kassla so he can wax lyrical about the hind D you're about to face. That's right, you might have noticed earlier that it look familiar because it's back, baby! And this time it moves! Off screen, that is. This is another Running Man situation, but less for theming and more to do with it probably being pretty hard to convincingly animate a hind D strafing across the screen on the MSX in 1989. Capable of hauling 12 metric tons with a top speed of 250 kilometers per hour and a max altitude of 4,500 meters, I don't know why they didn't just figure out how to fire off nukes from this thing. It could probably take on Metal Gear itself. Castle says that Stinger missiles even the odds on that, and he's right, because for as impressive as all of that sounds in a fight, it's actually not so difficult to take this thing down. These aren't the old RC missiles we're using. Equipping the Stinger missiles will plant Snake on the spot and give you control of a crosshairs on the radar. There's a delay between firing the missile and having it explode where you're aiming, so this is one of those don't shoot where it is, but where it's going to be situations. You need to switch off the stingers to be able to move Snake again, which seems like it would make this a challenging fight, but if you stay here in the corners, right in the middle of the screen, you can effectively keep the hind D at maximum distance at all times. And all it takes is five hits, and then... Zanzibar Tower is mostly sealed up at the front, save for this conveyor belt over here, and the colonel calls to say that you could use it to get inside because you're pretty good with a cardboard box. Tee hee, he said the thing, memes and all that. It's not that great here, we'll get into it. Campbell also says to check the manual because he's changing the transmission code, and you fucking serious, colonel? This weak ass early DRM attempt might be enough to stop some young pirate in the late 80s, but you understand that the enemy is still listening in, and also that Konami largely forgot there was a second code, right? That's how Black Ninja knew to wait for me. Changing the frequency isn't gonna do shit, especially when it's a standard operating procedure being used against the person who was in charge when those procedures were established. And when you get inside, Holly calls to tell you that she's been captured, and gee, I fucking wonder why, Holly. And she says she thinks the enemy doesn't know about her radio yet? Oh, <laughs> Holly, I have some bad fucking news for you. Also, what were you even doing here again? Some kind of expose? I'm honestly amazed they didn't just kill you when you were found. She explains her surroundings to Snake, who then repeats what she says, but really... slowly. Like... this. But... Worse? Somehow, and it just keeps fucking going. This isn't the only time he does this in the game, and I suppose it's meant to convey a certain seriousness, perhaps a dramatic tone. 
So this localization came after Metal Gear Solid 1 and 2, being released with 3, so this could also just be a nod to David Hayter's performances from those games. So the tower, as the name suggests, is 30 floors tall, but it's actually more like 5, plus the basement levels, so 7 in total. That's because you can only access the ground level, 10th, 20th and 30th levels, sort of, it'll come up later, and the roof. But you get the illusion of being in a tower, because the elevators make you wait as though you were ascending that many floors. And if you make the mistake of taking the wrong lift, which I did a lot of times while playing this... Now this lift on the outside will take you to floor 10, and then spiraling inward toward the center of the building you'll find the lift to floor 20, which also takes you to the basement levels. And then the very center is the lift to floor 30. Are you following? Good, it changes later. We're taking the second lift down to the basement, which has so many kids at this end it's basically a daycare center. But more importantly, it's also one of the only places, maybe the only place in the game with water, especially running water. Stop in this room here to pick up the plastic explosives because we'll need them. And then you come in here and there's nothing but another kid that references big boss through daddy issues and not much else. So let's just try the old punching walls trick and... Oh, 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 oh god, I, I didn't, I didn't see her. Oh god, oh god, I didn't see her. It's fine, if you leave and come back, she's still here. But I did basically use CQC on a kid and I don't think that'll make its way into the debriefing. You actually want the next room over with this awful droning which is totally a pump, I suppose. And you can see on the radar that there's a room here that there's no door for outside, so you know what to do. And of course, it's Holly, investigative journalist and espionage hobbyist. Drawn to look like a Barbie doll in both appearance and the way she moves, I don't understand what you're trying to say here about her character, Kojima. And Snake immediately hits on her because he is always horny and there is never a bad time for Snake to try it on. You know, I think I know where he gets it from. This is just madness. In the same conversation that starts out with Snake creeping on a woman he's just rescued from a POW situation, she tells you Dr. Marv is sending messages by carrier pigeon and says that the enemy might be listening, so here's the radio frequency I'm about to use out loud. But also, it just doesn't end with Snake. He tells her that the way she says goodbye isn't how a soldier would say goodbye, which is expected because she's not a soldier. But he goes on to say that it's how you'd say goodbye to your boyfriend. And dude, that's a creepy thing to say. But maybe it's also true? I don't know, it's been a while since I went outside and the 90s were a different time. I was only a child then, unburdened by the horrors of the modern world and long before I had the surgery. This sort of interaction between Snake and basically any other woman is very typical from this point forward in the series. Does love bloom on the battlefield? Snake is determined to find out. She mercifully leaves us with the mission of finding a pigeon, but before we can go up to the roof, there's something we need to pick up first and it's all the way back in building one. Now there's the slow way of backtracking, which is what I'm going to do now. Trudging back out of the building, past the desert screens, through the jungle, and back into building one so we can then go to the elevator, so we can then do the elevator juggling thing to get into the basement, which is where we need to go. I'm going to assume that the basement is some sort of armory for the Zanzibar Land Army, because when I went in, all I had was a pistol, some mines, and a single stinger missile, and when I came out, I had all this cool shit, including some grenades, which is what we came here for. Now to get back, we're gonna take the Sewer Express. The lower basement map has these trenches down the sides with some kind of slipstream thing happening, so swimming into them carries you at high speed toward the other end. You're gonna see me using this a lot, because there's practically no negatives. You do run down your O2 gauge while you're in there, but so slowly you'll be at the other end before you run out. And all that happens is that you might catch a cold, which means he sneezes sometimes while sneaking around, nothing major. Back up to the ground floor of the tower and into the center lift. Fucking finally. Okay, here we go. We've got some tripwires. There's a long hallway here. Maybe someone's gonna shoot me from down there. What?
What in the solid snake fuck? My grenades will see to it that your death is slow and painful? I'm pretty sure that's not how grenades work, but all right, Red Blaster, you just stay up there and don't touch me, you disgusting little wall goblin. Red Blaster, weird as he appears, is a complete jobber, just like the Hind D. Not all bosses are super critical to the plot, some of them are just here to fill out the roster. Sometimes you get NASA's ninjas that tell you about your forgotten war crimes, sometimes it's some dude named Red Blaster creeping around in the walls and lobbing grenades at you while you fumble over his tripwires. But while he takes an impressive amount of grenades to kill, you can literally just pace back and forth on the spot to keep him in range while avoiding his explosives. You know, at least it makes sense when he explodes. With that out of the way, we need to climb onto the roof of the tower to chase down Marv's pigeon. Nah. Nah. Oh, come on. <sighs> but wait, I don't have any rations. Specifically, the rations in the green tin, because as Johan will tell you, this kind of pigeon loves a certain kind of food, which is what will prevent it from flying away from us when we crawl near it. <sighs> come here. Come here, you little fucker. Eat your fucking beans! I'm using my hard-earned rations to lure in a pigeon so I can find out what it knows. What does this mission become? You find the note and it's supposed to look like gibberish at first glance, but take a quick look at it and see if you can work out what it's supposed to be. If you call Campbell, he'll basically spell out his stupidity for you, both by not understanding a simple code and also by revealing the fact that he didn't know Marv was in the US when he was captured because briefings are for other people, I guess. Fucking Ohio? Jesus, you're supposed to be military intelligence. He tells you to call Miller, who basically tells you what it is, and if you still can't work it out from there, you're as dumb as the Colonel, and when you call Miller again, he'll stop just short of drawing you a chart. So, 140.51. Yeah, that's about right for this game so far. This is the language barrier I was telling you about before, because calling Madnar for a quick what the fuck, he explains that Marv only speaks Czech, which is a problem, and that we'll have to go find their handler, Gustavo the STB agent, who's disguised as an enemy soldier, which is an even bigger problem. It shouldn't be a problem though, he says, since there are no woman soldiers in Zanzibar land, which is both a weird thing to say and also wrong, since if it was so noticeable then she'd have been caught by now. He then goes on to suggest setting up an ambush at the ladies' bathroom, which aside from raising more questions, no, Madna, can't I just, is she not wearing a different colored beret? Is she also a GI Barbie like Holly? No, I really have to spring a tap on her in the bathroom? All right, so let's make our way over there quietly. No joke alerts this time. I just, I don't want anyone to see what I'm doing here. So we go back to level four of the hangar building, which is the barracks for the soldiers. Living quarters, mess hall, weird number of kids around considering where we are, especially this girl just hanging out in a dark room that's full of pit traps. We make our way to the southeast side of the floor, go through the mess hall, and to get there... Oh no. Oh no, they know. No, please. They know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I deserve this. I deserve this! Okay, so go through this kitchen area and I guess just wait here? No, it's fine, Snake. It's fine. This is for the mission. You're a good person. You're a good person. This guard walks up, makes to enter the men's room before sneakily looking around and heading for the ladies instead. So, uh... I guess that's our target. No, that's... Mm, I'm, I'm not going with that. Uh, our person of interest. No, you know what? There's nothing that makes this better. Let's just go inside. Out of a uniform, but into a different uniform. This isn't that kind of game. Is Gustava Hefner of the STB. She knows who Snake is, presumably because she has ears and knows how to use a radio, and suggests that they work together to rescue Dr. Marv. Then Snake asks if they've met anywhere before. And dude, come on, you've already got Holly Spook. Just focus, all right? No, 
No, it doesn't matter if she was in the Olympics, and she's clearly not into it, man, so just let it go. Gustavo is a hard and decent blog woman, though. He can't throw her so easily the way he did with Holly, and she brings things back on track to Marv, forcing a sit rep out of Snake, taking his radio. They then have a full conversation in Czech that, look, I don't speak Czech any more than I speak Japanese, so I'm just gonna try to run some of this through Google Translate. Uh... Wait, what was that about a concentration? Gustavo dodges both that and the possibility that Marv tried to make a pass at her and tells Snake that the prison he's in is on the other side of a crevice to the north of the tower. She also says that Marv expressed concern about Madna. No, he fucking didn't. Snake pulls the focus back to Marv and says they have to get going, but why is she lying? She just coolly walks over to the back of the room and says she knows a shortcut to the crevice using the elevator. The elevator built into the back of the women's bathroom that goes to the basement. And no, no, there isn't a similar elevator in the men's, only in the women's bathroom. And you want to know what else is fucked up? Why does this connect to the women's bathroom? Oh my god, finally, I just... Oh, I, I need to catch my breath. <sighs> fucking... Fucking Zanzibar land, man. Okay, okay, good, we found him. The second time around, it's always the right one. The second time, it's always... Madna? We found him. Um, yeah, woo. Also, you seem awfully happy to see a dude who suggested I ambush you in the can. Weren't we supposed to be looking for Marv? I can't help but notice the distinct lack of a Czech scientist here, and you don't seem all that phased about this surprise development. Almost like you knew we'd find him here. Oh, hey, Madlock gives you an access card. Okay, yeah, we're fine. And then Madlock joins the party. And coming out of there, all of the machines are gone now. Huh. And then while running down the basement corridor, moments away from getting Mandar out of his prison, suddenly he stops and says that he has some business to take care of, and you know, I'm starting to sense a pattern here. Gustavo and Snake stop to have a heart-to-heart -heart about their life experiences, with Gustavo noting how this is so strange, and yeah, you're not kidding, I find this whole thing with Madna really coincidental, and you're not talking about that. Okay, moving on. Gustavo opens up about her life, growing up as a child in post-World War II Poland, hearing stories about her mother fleeing Nazis through sewers just like this one. How as an Olympic skater, the ice felt... cold. I mean, yeah? She then pivots to asking if I'm married and, wait, did Madna tell you to ask that? Snake says he has no family, that he knows of anyway, and Gustavo says she's likewise all alone, but not by choice. Snake horns in on that with checking for boyfriend status, which she smoothly counters about how she once considered getting married, how she fell in love with a western man, a one Frank Hunter, how she would have given up everything for him, even defecting to the west, but that the west rejected her bid for asylum at the last minute. She was left stranded in the eastern block, casting shame upon her family, and forcing her into the STB where she lives an altogether different life now. She never saw her love again. Then Madna comes back to interrupt, done with whatever obviously nefarious shit he was up to, even Snake is clearly suspicious by this point, but pay it no mind, we're nearly there. The elevator at the end of the corridor takes you back up to the surface level, and if you go in this truck here to stock up, you'll set off a landmine. The whole place is covered with landmines, and Snake can't crouch while the others are following him because I guess it's undignified or something. But that's fine, you're not gonna need any of it right now. Head over to the bridge, and Madna, selflessly, I'm sure, offers to cross first. Well, this is obviously a trap. No, come on, Gustava. Why did you say that? Why? You may as well have just said, okay, I die now. Ah, oh, fuck. I just... Fine, whatever. I can't stop this. Let's get it over with. And the missiles come down. Gustavo is miraculously blown back onto the cliffside and not, you know, to pieces. Which is what I'd expect when directly hit with high-speed ballistics. Snape rushes to her side, and in her dying moment, she reduces her life to a series of skating metaphors. Snake humors her and keeps it going, but she knows she's done for, and laments that such tragedy strikes just as she's found someone wonderful again. And I can only assume she's talking about Madna, seeing as she just jeopardized the mission and the safety of the entire planet to get a piece of that sweet Einstein ass. In lieu of a will, she just starts giving Snake all her stuff. An access card, her brooch, 
until she expires, but she doesn't explode when she dies, I guess that's just a mercenary thing. Madna calls for help, but honestly, fuck you man, getting dragged away by soldiers? Good, you better hope they kill you, because if I find you again, I'm gonna- Wait, what's that noise? Oh shit. And here comes Grey Fox with the puns. This bridge is closed, he shouts, standing over the smoking ruin of the bridge he just destroyed using his 9 meter tall robot. So you are working with Big Boss. At least now I know why he sent you into Outer Heaven first. He says he'll let you live for all time's sake if you give up and go home. Snake, you live in the wilderness anyway. This has been a mission of pure frustration so far. Maybe consider the killer robot's offer? At the very least, don't shout your plans to defy him into the air for everyone to hear. Actually, never mind. They're gonna hear everything when you call through to HQ anyway. Speaking of, Colonel, I have to report what's just happened. Dr. Madna was working against us all along, Gustavus been killed, and will you pay attention to the fucking mission? <coughs> nah, it's fine. I don't think anyone even watches this far into the videos. Also, what?